This is a moment for us where we reflect and dedicate and show appreciation for the wonderful things that our former president has done for us. It's a moment of appreciation, as I said earlier on. When I think of the president, I think of two things. The one is no one should feel left out. The other one is to say we must build a Namibian house where no one should feel left out. And the third one was around the issue of Namibia is a child of the international community, friend of all and enemy of none. So those will be my ever reflection and remembrance of our president. At this juncture, my, may I call Dr. Brady, uh, Betty Scruder from the American Methodist Ep Epistolical Church and the Council of Churches Exco member to open the proceeding for us with a prayer. Father, you hem in us behind and before us, and you lay your hand upon us. Such knowledge is too wonderful for us, Father God. It is high and we cannot attain. Where shall we go from your spirit, Father God? Oh, Father God, where shall we flee from your presence? We come this evening, Father God, just to say thank you. Thank you for a life that was given unto us. Thank you for the gift that you have given us. We honor the achievements, Father God. We honor the impact, Father God. We honor the reprimands, Father God. We honor the fellowship and the togetherness, Father God. We honor the leadership that was provided, Father God. And we pray that we continue to support one another through the pain of loss and remember those who are in grief. Father God, those of us who don't understand, you teach us in your word. Peace, you live with us. And as our president has left to prepare a place for us, Father God, would you bless his soul as we are with his remains, absent from the body, present with the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We now move to the tributes. We'll have two parts of tributes. The first three will be from uh, Menangula Wanja, the Chief Executive Officer of the Namibia Investment Promotion and Development Board, followed by Honorable Benedict Lik Likando, the Director General of the Namibia Central Intelligence Services, and lastly, Honorable Obed Kanjobe, the Director General of the National Planning Commission. Menangula. Your Excellency, President Nankolo Mbumba, Madam Gengos, uh, Right Honorable Prime Minister, I stand on the protocol observed. The Bible in Esther chapter 4 verse 14 B says, who knows Perhaps you have come to the royal position for such a time as this. It says elsewhere that there is a time for everything. And there is a time for a right leader for the right occasion. The Lord appointed His Excellency to lead Namibia at a time when the country was facing economic challenges that were unparalleled and a time that we needed a leader that will make bold decisions that were required to turn around our economy. When he promised the Namibian people prosperity in the first years or the first time when he ran, and then the first five years were faced with serious challenges, many started to wonder and doubt, where is the prosperity going to come from? He promised something that he was not able to deliver. And I'm sure that we heard everything that was coming. But I'm sure that the Lord made him see what we could not see. And that is probably one of the few places when you are as a leader, you can be so lonely. It is when you have got something that you are unable to share or when you are seeing something that other people are not seeing. He saw the prosperity that we could not see. 
It was probably like Moses leading the children of Israel to the promised land that he was seeing and they were not seeing, although he was not allowed to enter. I'm sure that the, the Lord made his excellency say the prosperity that is coming, that I'm believed, I'm believing that we will experience and our children will experience and that he was not able to enter, but I'm sure he saw it and he was glad. So I know that I've got a few minutes, so I will be as short as I was asked to. Many people will have known His Excellency for much longer than I did. Because yes, I know of His Excellency, but I met him when he asked us to help him with his asset declaration when he got married to who was my client at the time. So my client was the person who asked me to help her with declaring her assets. And when we did the work, His Excellency said, you should also do mine. And that's when I met him. And that's when I, bet, I, I spent a bit of time with him, and I kind of became his accountant, if you can put it that way, uh, to look at his uh, financial statements, some that were very old, and whether a president should be paying taxes and so forth. It's a few good conversations that we had. Uh, until I met him, there's a few decisions I had in my life that I know. One, I will never do, or this I will do. One of the things I said I will never do ever in my life was for work for the government. I said, never will you find me working for the government. Actually, somebody that I knew once told me, I got so and so a position at the SOE. And instead of congratulating, I told you, what a career limiting move. Um, we had a talk about it. And today, I am sitting here or standing here as a public servant. And it's after I met His Excellency and saw his heart for Namibia. And I felt like I needed to be part of the team that was going to support him to bring to bear the vision for Namibia that he saw, the prosperity for Namibia that he saw. And I knew it needed collaboration between the public and the private sector. It needed people who understand where government was coming from and people who understood how the private sector operates. And I asked myself, if I'm not that person, then who will be that person? And that is when we met. And yes, I remember the conversation I had with him just about sharing my overview of the Namibian economy. And he said, but then there's a, a position that I need somebody here to have. That's a position you should ever say, no, Excellency, I am not going to work for government. Uh, we had conversation, of course, which it took. It's a move that I will never regret because it's a move that although I told people I was leaving my job to get more hours in my life, I said I ended up with less hours in my life but more fulfillment. And it's an opportunity that he gave me. I'm not so sure if many people would have seen the potential that he saw for me to get that opportunity. I've learned a lot from him over the times that we have worked together. Three years is not a long time, but I've learned. So I will just come to here with a few comments about what did I note about His Excellency. Number one is his eye for talent. He knew how to identify and pick talent like not many people did. And he knew how to empower people like not many people did. And he was not scared to appoint talent when he identified that there is a talent. There is times that he sounded like a broken record. Systems, institutions, processes, the wave of African leaders. And I would say, does he not remember? He told me this two days ago. But I think it was his way of knowing that the systems, institutions, and processes of Namibia will be required even more so when it was just during his period. He's a straight talker. I'm sorry for the use of Oshwambo that I will use now, but I will say, I don't know how to interpret that one, but it's in English, normally they will tell you. He will tell you the way it is. And if you like gossip, be careful, because he will tell exactly the next person what you are told. So I know when somebody was telling His Excellency stories about me, because he will not come and beat around the bush. Yeah, but people are saying, you are doing this. 
So don't tell him gossip is not one to listen to. That gossip, he will share exactly what needs to be done. And that's what made him special. But that's also what made him misunderstood. People of his personality sometimes are misunderstood. He had a great and good sense of humor. If you are with him, you will always be smiling and laughing. And like I said, he will be talking uh, straight. And he had a heart of gold. He cared deeply for Namibia, for her people, for her pros prosperity. And we know that we have heard that he said no one must be left behind. This is not something that he said. This is something that he practiced. And this is something that he will challenge you with whenever you are with him. So I am concluding my remarks by saying, let us honor his excellency by practicing inclusivity, by respecting processes, institutions, and, uh, and systems, by identifying leaders and empowering them to do what we have called them to do. We pray that the legacy that he has left us, we will be able to carry it on. And I'm sure that he has trained and developed many leaders that will have bought into his heart and they will be able to serve Namibia to the best of their, ab of their ability. And I'm, sh I'm sure if he's looking back today, he knows that his job is done. You know, we as human beings, we want somebody to be here forever. But normally I tell people that when your job is done, you will go, it doesn't matter how old or how young you are. I'm sure that the Lord knew when the work that he has given to his excellency and when his assignment will end. And I'm sure that he knows his assignment has been accomplished. It's time that you and I stand up so that we can take over from where he left and we will complete the assignment that he has started. Thank you very much. Director General Likando. Excellency Dr. Nangolo Mbumba, President of the Republic of Namibia, our mother, Madam Monica Menkos, the Right Honorable Prime Minister, Nsara Kwangawa Madia. Let me stand by the protocol already established. The nation is mourning, the whole world is mourning, the NCIS in particular being a specialized unit that offered professional support to His Excellency the President in order to function effectively is also mourning. At the candle lighting that we did for the members of the NCIS, I could see literally tears flowing from the men and women of our noble specialized institution. Congress President, 
Genkov had a special place for the NCIS. He knew the role of the NCIS and he was always at the disposal of the NCIS. I had unfettered access to His Excellency, the President. He told me 24 hours seven, you are anytime call me that you want to come either at the house or at the office. And all the support services that were close to him can testify this. If I take a, a, a call, it will be only in five minutes. I will be told to come here now. He really was the father of the NCIS. One time, when I saw that the health of the president was almost not very good, I took a call and called him directly while he was at the office. He never called me by the name he used to call me, young man. That young man comes because in 1990, I served on the Secretariat of the Cabinet Committee on Defense and Security. So he used to call me, young man come. When I came at the office, I found him for the first time in his chair. And then he said, you came to disturb me, what do you have? I said, Comrade President, today my visit is simply to come and sit with you and we have a discussion. I have nothing to report. Comrade President was very happy. He moved away from his chair, then we moved to the sofas. While we were on the sofas, sitting, Parliament, there was a session of Parliament. He said, I don't miss watching Parliament, but because you are here today, we, I will miss Parliament. Then he walked, he said, come, let me come and show you. We came at the logo, the coat of arms, where it's written unity liberty and justice. He said, my young man, this is what I want for my people. <laughs> but many people don't look at this, the coat of arms. Unity. Unity. So whatever you do in life, unity must guide this nation. I was so impressed, we sat for more than an hour in the office and then I left. At some point in time, he told me I'm coming to your office, but I'll come unannounced. And he has been doing it. As prime minister, we had been seeing him just coming unannounced. More than three times. He simply came to our office during the time of the late uh, Comrade Shahama, may his soul rest in eternal peace. And he also came twice to our offices during the time, may his soul rest in eternal peace, uh, General Angula, and also Comrade Commissar Malima. That shows that he had 
his specialized unit at his heart. Last year, he told me, I want to come and see your training center because the capability lies there. I've been, I've been a principal, I know. I want to see whether you have that capability. I said, no, we are ready for you to come. We prepared everything. Only two days, he called me at the office. He said, young man, you are the only one that I'm starting to tell now. I cannot come to your institution. I have to go for a procedure. So unfortunately, I cannot come. It was the service day. Go and tell your people that at any point in time, I will be there. You are my people. Go and give a speech on my behalf. I delegate you to go and do that. At some point in time, he had light moments. One time, I came to the president at his house, very lightly, and then I said, Congress President, I think what, I, uh, what we see happening shouldn't worry you. It shouldn't be a problem. I don't want you to spend a lot of time on social media. We are there. We have that capacity to deal with that. And then I said, Comrade President, some of the things that I see on the media, they say, they say coup d'etat. Then he said, you, you, you read in, this, in, in the social media? I also just read in the social media. <coughs> then I said, Comrade President, let me assure you, if there will be any coup d'etat in this country, the first person to be taken is me. Then he said, you are the first to be taken? Oh, yes, then, then it's, it's fine. If there, are, if there are still people to be taken, then I'm the last. <laughs> oh, then uh, the country is safe. <laughs> then the country is completely safe. That was our president. In December the 22nd last year, out of the blue, I just decided I'm, I'm, as I go to Katima, I'll just pass at the farm. So arrangements were made as usual. We met, we went to the farm. We sat in a very relaxed, very relaxed atmosphere. Madam Monica Ginkos was also around. She saw us around. Why I'm mentioning it? I'm mentioning for two reasons. Comrade President made sure that Madam Monica does not get involved in state or official matters. So we'll all be sitting then, she'll be watching us from, from very far. And at the end, you'll, you'll come and say, now we, we can go and greet the madam. And that is how it has been. He informed me about his health. I said, I really appreciate. I hope, uh, Comrade President, you'll find time and go for further evaluation. And that was that. While I was on holiday, because as he normally does, President Genko will not stay a week 
if I don't phone him, he will actually just try me. There was one time he actually even called me at 12 o'clock. When me, he called at 12 o'clock, he said, you can come here to the house quickly now. In 15 minutes, I was here. Five minutes, he said, I wanted to check whether we are safe. <laughs> I wanted to check whether you are vigilant. And we laughed it off. I went back home. While in Katima, he said, I want to see you. You must come. <laughs> then I said, Colonel President, I think I'm ready to come now. And then he said, no, please. I think you, it's a holiday. Yeah, I, uh, you, you are not in Windhoek, so you, you must be there. But what I did was to simply cancel everything that I had. Say, the president spoke to me. And then I must come. So I came. And when I met him, I said to the president, he said, you are here, but I said you must enjoy young men. You must enjoy the holiday. I said, Comrade President, I've come because I, I knew you spoke to me I must, and I must be here. Then he said, oh, then you are a good officer. So you must always be that way. Then I said to the president, Comrade President, there are two things that, I always, that always worry me. When you phone me and I don't answer the phone, I will not sleep that night. I will not sleep. So I'm asking the president that sometimes you must check on my phone because I, I will spend sleepless nights. So we joked, and he joked, ah, you, that is very good. Uh, that should be that way. So we spoke whatever he wanted to in a very relaxed manner. We're having tea, he briefed me on all the circumstances. Then he said, young man, you can go. On the day that they were going to America, I was one of those very few people. He just said, come, now I want to see you. There were other people who were there, of course. When I came in, we sat and discussed. And he said, my young man, I've saved all my life. I've spent all my life from childhood up to now saving my people, being in politics. But my situation as it is now, young men, our journey is about to end. But I tell you, young men, continue saving your people as you saved me. That touched me. It really touched me. And I knew Comrade President is actually talking to me in a very frank, very candid manner. And when I left, I simply went and slept because these were really touching words. But I knew that that was a message. Comrade President was a family man. He was actually a family man. You would not finish a meeting without him asking, how, are, how is your family? Are you doing well? Is everything fine? If you have any problem, please don't hesitate to come to me. When I lost my mother during COVID, Comrade President said, 
You see, the situation does not allow me to go over it, but I'm with you. Every day he will phone twice, in the morning and in the afternoon. And when I came back, he simply said, before you start anything, come and see me. Uh, you should be the first person that you should see. Because losing a mother in life is not an easy. We are here. We are the fathers. We are your fathers and mother at Casa Rosaria. So don't feel being on your own. So Congress President was actually a person who had that heart. For many of the people, when you see him very far, a giant walking, you would maybe run away. But once you are close to him, you feel that special warmth. He, he would want to sit close to you, not very far. Come and sit here like a child. He had that feeling, and he would definitely do that. Congress President, within our office, he leaves a very good legacy, a legacy that will be there forever. He was being the commander in chief. At the same time, he was the first chairperson of the cabinet committee on defense and security, and the long-serving chairperson, where matters of national security are actually debated. Congress President leaves a legacy in the service for so many years. The service was not in the Constitution. But when we came to inform him that there's a need for the service to be in the Constitution, as he believed in systems, processes, and institutions, he said, yes, I think this is an oversight from all of us. This is an oversight we cannot do. If another president comes, then he can even just dismiss the whole, the whole it's not going to happen. I'll make sure that the service is in the Constitution. As we are speaking today, the NACI is actually a constitutional body that exists. In our discussions, Congress President will always have human security at his heart, food, water, and electricity. And for this, I want one quotation that have, he left with us. One life lost is one too many. The other one is, people don't eat the Constitution. Let me end up by quoting what he said during the memorial service of uh, his very close colleague and friend and comrade, Theo Binul Girab. I quote, the ladder of death is not timed by any person. In other words, there is an universal ladder. We all be climbing this ladder one day. Close court. Let me, on behalf of the men and women of our noble institution, convey our condolences to Madam Monica Gainkos, the children, the family, the entire nation. May the soul of our president rest in eternal peace. Thank you. Um, thank you, Director General. With that, um, Honorable Kanjove. Your Excellency, 
Dr. Nangolo Mbumba, the President of the Republic of Namibia, Madam Ginkos, the children, Bangaliso Fernandez Ture, Nangula Ahabi Kainkos, Oshoveli Munashimwe, Nino Kalondo, Dangos Kainkos, Kayla Elago, and Hage G. Gaingop Jr. The bereaved family, dear mourners, and the Namibian nation. At large, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Today, we honor the remarkable life of His Excellency, Dr. Hage G. Gango, the now late fourth president of the Republic of Namibia, a leader whose legacy will forever inspire generations to come. Her guest journey was not just one of political triumphs and tactics and negotiation, but a testament to the power of wisdom, compassion, and tremendous dedication so unparalleled. I just will talk on two issues that has brought me very close to serving this icon. And that will be by quote from the 26th President of the United States of America, President Theodore Roosevelt, who said, and I quote, it is not just the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man, the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done these better. The credit belongs to the man who is in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, unquote. <coughs> President Hage G. Gaingo, in the analogy of the quote above, was the embodiment of the man in the arena. From his time since leading the first cohort of dedicated Namibians back to his country of birth, Namibia, from exile right through the construct of the Namibian nation as we know it today. Dr. Hage G. Kainkop, represented the subject of ridicule from those who thought a strong man is stumbling, or became the subject of laughter from groups who differed and disagreed. Taking a look back in history, fast forward to today, I hold a very profound belief that the credit belongs to him late Dr. Hage G. Gango. The man in the arena and whose face is mad, was mad by dust and sweat and blood for the good of the Republic of Namibia, whose citizens he loved and selflessly served all his adult life. He dedicated his life to serving his nation from a young age with unwavering commitment and integrity from humble beginnings. 
of the son of a farmer. He rose to the highest office in the land, guided by a profound sense of duty and deep love for his country and its people. Second thing I want to share is intertwined with my own exit from government, from NAMCOR at the time, my apologies. On January 2013, 2014, I was in Cape Town doing the regular oil and gas work. When a call came in and he said, short man, where are you? That was my baptized official name by His Excellency, short man. Where are you in Cape Town? I've been calling you. You did not answer. Now listen carefully. You will be the next Minister of Mines and Energy. And you must know one thing. I accept no no for an answer. And he put down the phone. The second thing, the rest is history therefrom. Dr. Hage G. Gaingo and Madame Gaingos, you touched my family in a manner I have never known. Just shortly after the directive for me to come serve my younger brother, Moses Tunu Kanjore, was bludgeoned to death in the Aminus constituency. And as I was struggling with the reality of exiting government, exiting Namco, entering government, here was this big, maybe it was Mount Kilimanjaro, I could say, that I needed to climb without any proper preparation and equipment. And the two, came sat next to me in Komasdal for the duration of the memorial service. He sat there comforting me, my wife, and the rest of the family. Remember, I was an emotional wreck because this man, my late brother now, was brutally bludgeoned to death. I was traumatized. He was there for me. We say too many things. I was a complete political novice. Politics was hard. I couldn't consume the decisions. Be that as it may, I thank him for the wisdom. Stick around, he said. I stuck around. In the cultures that we so often forget that to the elders, to the seniors, you may be ministers in their cabinets. You may be colleagues in those chambers. The fact of the matter is the classes of birth are but the, are but the foundations of our culture. We need to remember that. Ever since the directive of January 2014, I've never literally said no to him. And that was because I believed that he was very stealthy and had steady hands at leadership. As I move on, 
the last profound statement he made, and Madame Gaingos was on the flight, was the trip to the United Nations in September 2023. That day I thought Air Force One was going to come down over the seas. For a senior man of his stature to call me to the front seats and openly say, short men, we must say these things before we die. So superstitious as many of us are, this was another difficult moment. He said, I have great respect for you. I had such goosebumps, I could not even feel my own body. For I thought, this couldn't come from him, I'm such a minnow. Why do I say this? The level of those who called him all kinds of names as arrogant, bully, and has no place for nobody. Look at the minnow myself and many others touched in the manner of how he spontaneously act. I have great respect for that man. Each moment, each day, weeks, and years with him was a reminder of the preciousness of life and the fragility of our existence. Yet amidst the sorrow there was also a sense of gra gratitude for the privilege of sharing any time with a soul so dear and iconic. I want to say, if he could only hear, thank you for all the encouragement I get. Thank you for the hard decisions for what you had to do in the line of government business. It was not personal, it was business. And somebody had to take the decision. For those of you who think I'm angry because of him, quite the contrary. I am at peace and was at peace because he was my father I never had. Finally, to you, Madame Gengos, the children as I call them by their names, and the entire family, including myself, and all of us sitting here today, please do be comforted by the presence of the laugh filling this room and many other halls, all the regions of our country, the world at large. You are not alone. In the embrace of family and friends, may you find comfort and strength to carry you through this tragic time. Our hearts ache with yours. The words may seem inadequate. Please know that our thoughts and prayers are with you. I thank you for the honor bestowed and the opportunity granted. We now call on Veronica Teron, the technical advisor of the former office of the First Lady of Namibia. Your Excellency, Madame Gainkos, Right Honorable Prime Minister, bereaved family, allow me to stand on the protocol already established. It is an absolute honor, and I'm humbled to do this tribute on behalf of the office of the former First Lady, Madame Gainkos, and the One Economy Foundation. We were privileged to witness firsthand the extraordinary life of service lived by the late 
uh, President, His Excellency Dr. Hadi G. Genko. He was our number one stakeholder, our partner, our cheerleader, and guest of honor at all our annual fundraising gala dinners. We can attest to how consistent he was as a giver. Uh, he was one of our first donors every year to receive his pledge since 2016 until late last year. We bear witness to the lives of so many young people impacted and transformed through the Hagi Gengop Endowment Fund. Students who received funding for their tertiary studies in law, engineering, accountancy, medical studies, a fund that he entrusted our office to administer. We can also attest to the monthly contribution from his own salary for the community in Kalkfeld and the food parcel they received consistently on a monthly basis. We got to know His Excellency as a humble person. And I can vividly remember how he would unannounced what the young people would say, a whole head of state would walk all the way from the private office into our meeting halls just to check up on us. And I can remember the reaction of the staff. The leadership of His Excellency characterized by integrity, compassion, dignity, and transparency shaped the values and principles of our office. This very heart that breathed life into our programs. As managers in the, in the pres presidency, we were constantly reminded by His Excellency how both effectiveness and efficiency are important for a workplace to function properly. When I spoke to some of the people working cl worked, who worked close, closest to him, they gave attributes of vulnerability, but vulnerability in a positive, great sense. Vulnerability that made him approachable and relatable. It is this attribute that angered those who worked with him and who were supposed to protect him. But he would always tell them, triumph over evil. Those are their opinions. He had his spirit embodied resilience and hope. Today we mourn the passing of one of the greatest leaders ever, not only in Africa, but in the world, but we find courage and strength knowing that the generational legacy will be evident in the many young lives touched and impacted. His profound love for his country is reflected in the outpouring of heartfelt condolences from all over the world. Madame Genko's former first lady, our Flon, and the whole bereaved family, the children. I want to leave with you the promise in Matthew 5.4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's a promise. God will turn your brokenness into beauty, and the nation will be there to witness it. I thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Trot, for that dedication. We now call on the staff of the presidency, followed by Ambassador Grace Ushona. The staff will be delivering a, a selection, and thereafter, Ambassador Ushona will be making her dedication. Your Excellency, President of the Republic of Namibia, Dr. Nangolo Mbumba, the bereaved widow, Madame Kainkos, and the children and the entire family, fellow employees of the office of the president, fellow mourners, I will stand by the protocol as 
mandated by the chairperson of the proceedings. Let me first and for almost say the most difficult part of standing here this evening is that I never thought that I will be here for the reason that we are all together, gathered here. I never thought I would have one day paid tribute to a man who was larger than life itself, a towering giant, a fearless leader, and a lion equally as a gender as a lamb. In paying our final respect to our beloved hero and Menda, allow me to highlight some of the unique features of His Excellency Dr. Kenko. As an administrator of note, and how through his guidance, we achieve the required milestone at the presidency. Dr. Kenko, was very particular on work ethics and etiquette in the day-to-day -day running of the office. He also had high expectations about the conduct of all staff members in the presidency. In this context, he always encouraged all those in the presidency to go beyond the line of duty. To ensure that the highest office in the land of the brave will become the center of excellency. For example, the president will call regularly on offices, lines, not cell phones, and expect that the office line should be answered promptly. Also, he would undertake regular visits to our offices unannounced and query, what are you busy with? Or if you are not in office, where are you? And what are you doing there when I'm here at your office? Thirdly, he emphasized on the mantra of effectiveness and efficiency. To demonstrate the difference between effectiveness and efficiency, he always narrated the story of Bertha. Bertha is one of the extraordinary PA of the president and the sending out of emails without following to confirm receipt and a clear response. Consultations. His leadership style was consultative and to this end, he would consult his senior staff members at the round table. We used to call it the famous round table. Where administrative and policies issues will be interrogated and deliberated on. Afterwards, the president would take a firm decision and direct on the way forward. It will not end there. Dr. Kainkop, being meticulous, would always expect feedback. Consultation was so important to the president, and this he would always ask whether you have consulted the relevant stakeholders. And if you have not, you will be sent back because the assignment is incomplete. Inclusivity. The concept of inclusivity was not only a mandra, but a way of living of our president, as he made us 
all feel part of this administration of this country. He would often jokingly ask us at the round table as we are sitting, here is everyone in the Namibian house, included in our office. In this way, he was driving home the need for intensify in all that we do. In this regard, the president opened state house to all Namibians, including school children, pensioners, artists, choirs, sports personalities, members of the public, and so on. State House truly became a Namibian house. Our president was a nationalist of note who did not discriminate against anyone based on race, region, and tribe. He abhorred any of the SMS. He was Namibian first before any, anything else. Announced office visits, unannounced. The people's president would occasionally make turns at our offices on interact, to interact with us. When he visit my office, I will stand up to give him my chair to him, and he would always say, no, sit down. This is not my office. It's your office. I came to visit you. What a great honor to me was it. President was fondly loved by the staff members in the office as he would interact with them at any point he wished to do so. He would never pass a staff member without greeting them and would always ask, who are you? What do you do in the office? <laughs> no, I'm working in this, de what department before you finish, finish your words? Followed by then jokes and laughter. December year and function. In December, we as we are all standing here as staff members in the presidency, we were privileged to spend time with the president during the year and function on a Friday afternoon. We spent so much time with him until late evening. At the occasion, many staff members took selfies with him, and he also danced with us to the tune of Dog. Dear Monas, that is the leader we are here to pay tribute to. We know the successes of our president were made possible by the support and love of his beautiful wife, Madame Monica Kinkos, and the children. Please, Madame, and the children and the family, be comforted in that the entire staff of the presidency are sharing your pain and would like to reassure you of our continuous support today, tomorrow, and in the future. You will always be part of us as a family. On behalf of the staff in the presidency, it has truly been an honor to all of us to serve this icon leader with us. And we will dearly miss him. Farewell, Comrade President. Until we meet again, 
as the path of all of us is where you are today. Thank you. I'm sure if the president was listening to all these good things that are being said, he would be saying, Omake, isn't it? Omake. So that will be a remembrance forever. Dr. Alfredo Hengari, the press secretary, Office of the President. <coughs> His Excellency, Dr. Nangolo Mbumba, President of the Republic of Namibia, Madam Monica Genkos, the third First Lady of the Republic of Namibia, Right Honorable Prime Minister, Sarah Kukongelwa, Mangaliso, Nangula, Keila, Dankos, Nino, Oshoveli, Jr., the entire bereaved gang and Kalondo families. Fellow mourners, permit me to stand on the established protocol. I am humbled to have been accorded the opportunity to speak on behalf of the private office in the presidency about the third president of the Republic of Namibia, His Excellency, Dr. Hake G. Gengo. I also feel the unbearable weight of the task. In his melancholic poem, Solo la Muerte, which translates into English as only death, the 1971 Nobel Prize in Literature and controversial activist but elegant poet, Pablo Neruda, says, says the following about death in the two stanzas that we have selected. Death arrives at the sonorous point, like a shoe without a foot, like a suit without a man in it. I don't know, I'm familiar with so little. I can hardly see, but I believe that its song has the color of damp violets, or violets used to the earth because the face of death is green, and the look of death is green, with the sharp dampness of a leaf of violet and the wintry color of the grave. The poem by the celebrated Neruda reminds us that as a nation, we are abruptly coping with the stark and painful reality of having lost to death one of the finest and best amongst us. 
we are under unbearable pain and defeat because as Neruda says, death arrives at the sonorous point like a shoe without a foot. We are inconsolable. We don't even know if President Gengob would have found the vocabulary to console us. In fact, he struggled with words to console when visiting bereaved families. Madame Gengos has many anecdotes to that effect. And I recall how President Gengob told a grieving widow, unfortunately, death is reserved for all of us. We have to be strong. But during this hour of grief, as advisors, executive directors, students, aides, and staff members under the watchful eye of President Gengob, even in this darkest hour, we are compelled to celebrate not only a brave and iconic leader of the people of our land, but our teacher and our boss. To some in their private office, he was Hefe. To others, he was president. We are here as witnesses to add to the puzzle in the life of an extraordinary and exemplary servant of the Namibian people and humanity at large. We are witnesses in the private office to the life of a skilled politician who graced the global corridors of power and the vast expanse of our land with a sense of mission and gravitas. Yes, you could feel his infectious passion and affection for ordinary Namibians when he interacted with them. Yes, you could feel his infectious passion for Namibians when he fought for their interest in global fora. A Pan-Africanist, yes, you could feel the infectious passion of President Gengo for the African continent and Africans in their diaspora. For a country which pursues small state diplomacy, President Hage J. Gengop played an outsized role in shaping the agenda of peace in Africa and the furtherance of the ideal of solidarity and justice for humanity at large. As chairperson of the Southern African Development Community in 2018, he marshaled with panache difficult dossiers on the Democratic Republic of Congo and shared solutions among conflicting parties with his trademark pragmatic and calm rationality. Unquestionably, President Gengo was cut out for the ethical path of life that he walked with integrity, agency, and untold grace in fulfillment of the independence of our country and the formidable but attainable mission of prosperity for all Namibians. Fellow mourners, I recall the occasion of the 70th birthday of Dr. Hageji Gengop in August 2012 or 2011 or so, when the late Honorable Theo ben Gurib was asked to deliver remarks about Dr. Gengop, where he said, Hage is that difficult but kind uncle. Judging from his facial expression, our boss was not pleased with the first part. I suspect that he would have preferred the word demanding or perfectionist instead of difficult. A vertical but also horizontal leader, many of us experienced the demanding and perfectionist side of President Gengo. Intolerance for explanations when the work is not done, intolerance for sloppy work, intolerance for blame shifting, which to him demonstrated the absence of loyalty and taking one for the team. To say that I'm not the one who is delaying this or that document was enough to annoy him. All of us received his legendary hair dryer treatment in his office or the round table. A lieu he adored so much. He would spend hours on concepts and doctrines such as the three waves of African leadership, transparency plus accountability equals trust, and many others. As part of his deeply held wish for an inclusive Namibian house, President Gengo would emphasize the er eradication of tribalism, racism, and all other forms of division. An agile multitasker, 
President Gengob would talk syntax, grammar, and why the sentence construction in a text is wrong. A state of the nation address would go through his hand 11 times with questions around arguments, facts, and mistakes meticulously underlined. President Gengob was affable and could walk into our offices, sit down to follow on task, and just to chat about this or that issue. For President Gengob, work was not just work or heavy burden to carry. It was part of his raison d'etre for being in service of others. It is why President Gengob worked with so much intensity and expected those around him to do the same. A force of nature, President Gengob had high-pitched standards. He was proud to say that as a teacher, he used to be strict in marking. True, working with him felt as if 90% of your performance did not count for much. We only had 10% in which we could get 10 out of 10 to deserve praise. When we had assigned you a task, since he was a fast thinker, you, need to be, you needed to be ready for many follow-up questions that could get you in trouble. However, when the work was executed properly, he was extremely generous in praise. That is the hallmark of a top leader, a great teacher, and affable mentor. We also witnessed around the, right table, the, the round table a leadership that believed in concert and consultation with the vice president, the prime minister, and other members of the executive. Fellow mourners, you may ask why we chose a Chilean poet to accompany our tribute. We chose Pablo Neruda because he believed in a poetry of bread where everyone may eat. Neruda also give, gives the color green to the face of death, which imposes optimism and guides us to the lessons of regeneration that we must draw from our interactions with Pre President Gengo. Throughout his four lives, first as a teacher in Sumeb, second as a Swapo freedom fighter in exile, third, as chairperson of the Constituent Assembly and Prime Minister, and fourth, as president of the Republic of Namibia, President Gengob was, was animated by the emancipation, the unity, and the development of the Namibian people and the African people at large. When he said in 2015 that we must er eradicate poverty, he meant it. In fact, to believe, to deeply believe, and to work hard as President Gengob did to ensure that everyone must eat bread speaks to the kindness and generosity of his spirit and soul. Many of us in the private office served as his emissaries to give on his behalf assistance to this or that person in distress. We received calls from him about his consent for this or that person who was unwell or in hospital and that he needed to visit. There was an internal tone about President Gengo. In addition to the pursuit of excellence, the most valuable lesson we should draw from the life of President Gengo is to care for the weak, the vulnerable, those without a voice, and those without means. I recall on one occasion when we returned from the inauguration of uh, President Museveni in 2021, and he decided to land in Court Fontaine uh, to go to his farm, Hadaloha. Upon landing in Court Fontaine, the presidential falcon experienced problems because a bird had hit it, and we could not proceed to Ventu. The remaining members of the delegation needed to be lodged in Tsumep. True to his sense of duties to others, President Gengob called me to find out if everyone was settled and had found accommodation. I said to him, yes, Honorable Yvonne Dausab and Tom Maluendo are accommodated at Kufet Kwele in Lodge in Sumeb. 
He was visibly irritated by, by my response and said to me, what you have just shared is not the full picture. You are only telling me about ministers. What about Mercia, the photographer? What about Thomas, my bodyguard? Are they okay? This is just one of many examples that all of us can share and that demonstrate his humanity and watchful eye over the interest of each and every one. Certainly, the Gaingop heritage is a rich bouquet of enduring values that he shared with all of us through his acts of kindness. Many of you out there may have grown to appreciate a president of the people, an astute politician, a champion of effective governance, and a statesman. But in Dr. Gaingop, we have grown, we have grown to be fond and to love the human being even more. We conclude with one of the favorite verses of President Gengop from the Bible during periods of mourning and loved one. Psalm 34 is 18, which says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. As the private office, we console with you, Madam Gengos, on your loss of an amazing partner an exceptional leader of our people. By the way, I, I always ask myself, how did you get it right to, to talk for five hours with him on a plane? Or every, the, this sense of conversation really demonstrated to us that it was indeed a solid partnership. We console with the children and the entire family for the loss of a dedicated father and family patriarch, one you generously gave, gave to save Namibia and humanity. We are extremely proud of the journey President Hake G. Gengob worked with us. His legacy, his legacy is rich and eternal. Farewell, our scholar President Dr. Hake G. Gengob. May the humane soul of President Hake G. Gengob rest in eternal peace. See TB Terra Levis, President Hake G. Gengob. May the earth Rest, rest lightly on you, President Gengo. I thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hengari and the staff from the private office of the presidency. We're now moving to the last tribute for the evening to be delivered by Honorable Christine Webers, the minister in the presidency. Your Excellency Nangolo Mbumba, President of the Republic of Namibia, Right Honorable Sarah Gwangelo Amadila, Prime Minister of the Republic of Namibia, Madam Monica Kengos, former First Lady, children, and the bereaved Kengop and Kalomo families. Allow me to stand on the already established protocols. Cometh 
the men cometh the hour. When the situation is tough and when the time comes, a man who can turn the tide and win the situation comes. When the need arises, the right person will step up to fulfill it. Hake, the president, was that man. Hake, in our vernacular, means the one who came. He came and stepped up and stepped into situations that seemed impossible. Being the man of the hour, he broke norms. He shuddered glass ceilings. He walked out new paths and created the roads. He was a trendsetter from establishing the very governance structure we pride ourselves in today to be the first of so many. An astute leader and governance architect, a top diplomat, a negotiator and debater, a father and a husband, an uncle, my boss and my mender. I remember a few days after I was appointed as minister in the presidency, I was a deputy minister of international relations and cooperation. And as minister, I was driving on my way to the new office and I received a, a call from an unknown number. And I knew even as a deputy minister, he would call me and give me tasks. And now as a minister in the presidency, I knew any unknown number would come from the boss. And I missed the call and I immediately called back. And I said, I am returning the call from my president. And he says, I didn't call you. I said, okay, I, I thought my president called. Am I crazy? I said, no, Your Excellency. And I said, goodbye, Your Excellency. And he calls back. And another call comes in a few minutes thereafter. So, oh, I forgot you are the minister in the presidency. <laughs> it was me who called you. I want you to start initiating, initiating a list of people that you think I can appoint as governors. And that was my first assignment. And I think, how am I forgotten so quick after being appointed? I came to know the president as a selfless leader whose only preoccupation was the well-being of Namibians from his time in exile to his final days of his presidency. He was a painful perfectionist who had an eye for detail. He set excessive high standards and overly critical, but he was also generous when he, with his praises, when things goes his way. He would scout for talent and bring such closer to him. I'm honored to be counted among those he has scouted and brought to his office as his minister. It is not a small feat to work alongside this decorated giant of a man a leader of note with unparalleled wisdom and intellect. Being a perfectionist that he is, he was, I remember, when we were organizing the conferment of the National Honors event. He has designed this event in his mind and he wanted it to be performed exactly the way he pictured it in his mind from which chair would be put where 
and how the officers would stand, how they would be dressed, and how the person that would read the citation should sound the tone and intonation of his voice. He dictated everything. And as we were running around, giving him the event that he wanted, we forgot to, inv to invite the first lady. And he exploded. He actually almost did not attend that event. Now, one thing is, he's such an ex a, a perfectionist, and he always had an issue with a show on NBC, which is called the Next Matraisa Star <laughs> Show. Wherever I am, I would be called on a Saturday afternoon. Minister, are you watching this thing? And I knew it was the next Matraisa show. Why are you not bringing these people to me to teach them how to speak and how to dress? And the other Saturday, I would be called, Minister, where are you? Are you watching this show? Yes, Governor President. I knew wherever I was, I would always be close to TV during that time because he would call me. I told you to bring these people to me. I want to teach them how to speak properly, how to present this thing, and how to dress. Look at how they are dressed. And I was the one who never brought the next Matraisa show to the president to be taught, because he looked at them as very unprofessional. The president was a family man who loved his family so, so much. My most treasured moments in the offices when I would go into the office with work and he would sit me down and we would talk about his family, about his journey, the exiles, about Swapo and so forth and so forth. I know so much about Nanki, I know so much about Dangos, I know so much about Hake, I know his love for all his children. I know about his grandson. That day he called me from, from home. He didn't go to office in the morning and he just wanted to chat and he called me and he said, you know this grandson of mine, we were watching soccer last night and seemingly he's not Liverpool and he has been teasing me and I just wanted us to watch soccer good soccer not to be teased but he kept on and on and on and on and, and, and I was listening because my president is complaining to me and I was saying yes come my president but why is he doing that why is he doing that it's not right, it's not fair. And I think Liverpool was losing. And he needed to vent. He needed to vent, he was looking for an outlet. He said, let, let me call Christine. He was just a man. And not a president when he was venting, when he was licking his wounds, because he was wounded. He was looking forward to spend Christmas with his family at the farm. And we were gossiping, Comrade Chifeta, <laughs> that his wedding was so close to Christmas Day. And I was saying, no, that wedding is, is not for us, <laughs> south of the red line. 
The president would share so many stories and incidents with me of his life spanning over 60 decades of his work and his experience. And I would always ask him why he doesn't read, write a book. And lately he started talking about writing a scholarly book covering thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. <laughs> the president was a remarkable man. He had an imposing physical stature and a visible presence. His voice roared like a lion, and that in itself was intimidating to the uninformed. But he had the smallest heart. His compassion and empathy were evident in his efforts to uplift the marginalized and the vulnerable. He had a heart for people. He had assisted countless individuals, those he has met personally and those he has never met. He would call me and ask me, Minister, how much do you have? After sending me a, a message, forwarding a message that somebody in distress has sent him, how much do you have? How can you assist this person? And after two hours, he would come back and ask, how have you assisted this person? I said, no, we are still consulting, but we are going to assist. And the day thereafter, I would give him feedback because he loved having feedback. His legacy will forever be etched in the history of our nation. As he has dedicated his life to the betterment of the country and the people that he so loved. Now to our beautiful First Lady. We have been part of your professional lives and we have even been part of your private lives. And therefore we bear the pain of your loss equally. You have loved our president unconditionally. I am comforted by the fact that our president left this world knowing that he was dearly, dearly loved. You were a force, the two of you, who has stormed the world stage of so much power. The two of you together made Namibia a loved place. You have drawn so many to this country and Namibia became the talk of the international town. The love and affection that you had for one another was so visible and it was so contagious. The adoration that you had for your husband was enviable, but also admirable. You loved our president to his death. You cared for him, you nurtured him, and you loved him to his last breath. And therefore, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. I want to thank you. On behalf of the presidency, I want to thank you. Because we could see how uncovered the president would look when you were not with him. Thank you very much for standing by our president to his last breath. May the Lord console you because we believe as Christians that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And now that you are close, now that you are brokenhearted, 
the Lord is even more closer to you. May the soul of our beloved president rest in eternal peace. Thank you, Honorable Webes, for the tribute and also for expressing the gratitude to Madam Kengos. Thank you, thank you so much, and to the children too. We now go to for the vote of thanks to be delivered by Honorable Emma Teofilis, the Deputy Minister of Information, Communication, and Technology. Thank you very much, Program Director, Ms. Valencia Uiras, His Excellency, Dr. Nangolom Bumba, the President of the Republic of Namibia, uh, Madam Monica Genkos, the third First Lady of the Republic of Namibia, the children and family, Right Honorable Prime Minister Sarah Kungra Madila, ministers and fellow mourners. I am honored to be here with you tonight to deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of the government of the Republic of Namibia as we pay tribute to our late president, Dr. Hage G. Genkop. My task tonight is simple in thanking everyone that has contributed in one way or form to the successful holding of this memorial services here at Casa Rosalia. However, I know in my heart that it would be amiss of me not to say a few words about the great statesman that was Dr. Hage G. Genkop before completing my task. A lot has already been said about the man Comrade President Genkop was, the great things he has been able to accomplish, and the aching gap he has left behind. A lot more can and will be said at the platforms to come until we send him off to his final resting place. Tonight, I want to leave you with a poem by the great Maya Angelou titled, When Great Trees Fall, and it reads, when great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder. Lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber after safety. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly. Our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity. Our memory, suddenly sharpened, examines Nose on kind words unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die and our reality bound to them takes leave of us. Our souls dependent upon their nurture now shrink. Our minds formed and informed by their radiance fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable ignorance of dark cold caves. And when great souls die, after a period, peace blooms, slowly and always irregularly. Spaces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses restored never to be the same whisper to us. They existed, he existed. We can be and be better, for they existed. Dear fellow mourners, Kumi President Dr. Hage G. Genkop did indeed exist. He existed in every fiber of Namibia. He existed in our laws. He existed in our values and principles that underpin our nation. He existed in the very way, way of life of every Namibian because he influenced it heavily from the 1960s until this very year of 2024. They say that our God Almighty gives the toughest battles to his toughest soldiers. And boy, did he give Comet President Genkop tough battles. Comet President led us through the economic downturn, a stubborn reoccurring drought, and the COVID-19 pandemic. But true to the mantra of his number one football team, Liverpool FC, he ensured that we never walked alone. President Genkop was a champion of young people. I am living proof of that. He used to say that education made it possible 
for the son of a farm worker to become the president of a country. In my case, education and his political will made it possible for the daughter of police officers to become a political office bearer. Now, every young person in Namibia can dream about having a seat at the decision-making table because President Gainkop made that possible. He believed in exposing people to what the rest of the world could offer so that we can go and learn and bring it back home to build their prover proverbial Namibian house. He was a staunch believer in democracy and press freedom. He was a man so content in himself and his abilities that he didn't mind surrounding himself with talented and knowledgeable people. And he had so much good knack for finding talent and nurturing it, as so many other speakers have said. Moreover, he believed in being true to oneself. And this is why President Genkop would tell you a story six to seven times, forgetting that he has already narrated the story to you, but the details of his stories would never change. He truly believed that the truth never changes, only lies do, something he has said often. Madam Genkos, our mother, thank you for affording us the space and the time today and early in the week to congregate at your residence in order to pay our respects to your late husband, our president, the people's president. We are here to comfort you, your children, and the family. We are here. We share in your pain. We share in your loss. Lean on us in this great time of emotional need. To the esteemed speakers who shared their touching tribute this evening, thank you for sharing your lived experiences of our late president. Your words have offered comfort and solace. You have allowed us to reminisce fondly on the great memories that we too shared with our beloved departed president. I'd like to further thank all the government staff in all their capacities for organizing these memorial services and lifting a small burden off of all of us as we converge earnestly and with open, pain-stricken hearts in paying homage to an icon. Finally, I would like to thank all of us for coming to share and support one another in these extremely difficult times, whether physically here at the residence or whether in various towns across the country or those that are following online from across the world via the NBC and MICT platforms and expressing their profound solidarity. Dear fellow mourners, there was never two Hageji Gang Cops. There was only one, and there will be no other. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to experience in this lifetime the icon that was Dr. Hage Gottfried Genkop. Namibia truly, our motherland, has lost a great son. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Theophilus, for the vote of thanks. I now call on Johannes, uh, Reverend Johannes Theo Benz to do the closing prayer and benediction. I believe there are a number of other pastors they could accompany him uh, for the benediction. Let us pray together that the Lord could keep and comfort those who mourn the death of our beloved president. Now I ask my colleagues that they stretch out the hands to the family while we bless the family and the entire nation. Receive the benediction of Christ. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May his grace, his love, and the communion of the Holy Spirit heal us, our broken hearts, in the name of the Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with our grief.